Welcome to the Gazelle School of Business webinar on simplifying your service model so you can compete with all the noise out there in the world. Uh, this is one of the many free webinars we're offering to the piano service industry that will cover every topic you can imagine related to the building and running a piano service business. Now, Luke will be monitoring the Q&A and the chat, uh, so you can ask your questions there, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. So let's dive right in. Now, most piano technicians lose customers and revenue by overcomplicating their business model. So simplifying your business model is a process, not an event. There's application time for this webinar is about one hour per week. Compounded over the next three to five years, this is enough time to simplify every aspect of your business. Now today, I'm here with Timothy Barnes, a registered piano technician and the co-founder of Gazelle. Timothy's also the founder of Well Up Piano, registered piano technician, and someone who's learned from experience the value of simplifying the way you do business. You know, George, in hindsight, as Well Up Piano started to grow, I didn't think things were very complicated. Uh, I actually thought that it was the opposite. I thought I was doing pretty well. I had my systems, my way of doing things, and it was working really good. But as my business grew, problems were exposed and everything had to be addressed. Things were too complicated and I had to learn how to simplify. Yeah, and you really built your business just as the internet and social media started to take off. And the truth is, nowadays, everyone and everything is our competition. Now, looking back, somewhere between you know, 2005, 2010, Facebook, Google, Amazon, they made it really easy to connect with anyone in the world. You fast forward 10 years, and everyone and everything suddenly becomes the competition. So it's not just you and your business. It's every business out there today. And we're all drowning in the sea of infinity. People are starting to feel taxed by all this digital noise, and it's only going to get worse. But you can differentiate your business if you simplify. And simplifying is easy if you admit you have a problem, say no to the right things, and stay focused on your goals. The key is to be intentional and focused. If you or your business just add to the noise in people's lives, then you are not going to do anybody a service. However, if you help them save time and don't overcomplicate their decision, you will have added something important in their life and you will stand out in a crowd because of your simplicity. But you can't get there without being intentional and focused. So what we're talking about here is the idea that simple equals easy. If you make something simple for your customers, they will interpret it as being easy. And if you say something simple, they will understand. And if you can make things so simple that they understand it, then they'll be able to quickly make a decision and then repeat your story to somebody else. And some of the best businesses out there have built their entire brand on this model. Don Miller talks about this a lot in his book, Building a, Better, Building a Story Brand. At a high level, we're talking about making it easy for people to do business with you. But this is really hard to do when you suffer from the curse of knowledge. Now, the curse of knowledge is this. You're a piano professional. You understand pianos at a level 10. So you dumb things down a bit and talk to people about their piano on a level 5 or 6. But your clients are normal people. They're going to make a decision on a level one or two. So everything between two and six is the curse of knowledge. You're talking over your clients' heads, and that makes it really hard for them to make a decision and act. But more than that, we are also talking about making it easy for you to do business with you. Because if you make it super easy to run your business, you will have more time to devote to the things that are really important. And if you can make it easy for customers to do business with you, easy for you to do business with you, then when you decide to grow your business or take on an apprentice, it will also be easy for people to join you. Your simplicity will be a selling feature of your own entire business model. Now, if you want to do anything, simplicity is the first step. 
your instinct will be to develop a complicated plan. But if you want to succeed, you need to go in the opposite direction and make it so simple. You find yourself asking, did I make it too simple? The answer is no. So think about it. If you want to retire, you need more simplicity. And if you want to launch and grow a business, you need simplicity. And if you want to grow your brand, you definitely need simplicity. You also need it if you want to make your job easier. Odds are you probably already know things are too complicated. And so you, you're here. You, you know that you need simplicity. And if you want to attract better clients, then you really need simplicity. Now, for the rest of this webinar, we're going to go through the different areas of your business and help you identify things that need simplification. So, simplify your goal. So the first thing we need to do is clarify where we're going. I'm not talking about a general you know, that way. I'm talking about something like, uh, in two years, I want to own a business that does $150,000 in revenue and requires no more than five years a week of office work. Now, this is an application of being intentional and focused. George, you said uh, five years a week. I think you five hours. five hours a week. Five hours a week. <laughs> We're gonna simplify that five years to five hours. Business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, five hours a week. That's right. Uh, that's, revenue. that's good. All right, so if you look around, most people don't have a clear destination. And if you don't know where you're going, then you're probably on the right path. So just keep on doing what you're doing and everything will be fine, right? Well, the truth is it won't. What we're talking about is saying, this is the path that I'm on and this is not good enough for me, right? I want something different and I want to do this very specific thing with my life and my business. And all of my energy is going to be focused on building that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The trick here is, again, to be super specific. Now, notice earlier I picked two things. I'm going to do this and this, and that is it. And once I achieve my goal, I can choose to do something else. But until I achieve whatever goal I've set, I am going to put all of my energy into this one thing and then this other thing, and I'm going to stay focused until it all comes together. And the best way we found for doing this is to shrink your end goal. That's right, I said it, do less. Now this isn't an excuse for laziness. Now this is just saying, I have five years to achieve my goal. I have limited resources, so I'm gonna focus on small achievable goals. Not all of my energy is spent chasing rabbit trails. No, it's spent being focused and intentional on the one thing. And every action, every step moves you closer to your destination. Attainability is the key. I could ask you to jump 10 feet, or I could ask you to jump two feet five times. One way, you'll throw your hands up and say, I can't do it. And the other way, you will accomplish it without even thinking about it. So you need to make your goals attainable and give them a specific time frame. And learn to say no. If you attempt to simplify your business, uh, and it's paramount that you learn to say no, because there's not enough time in your life to get distracted. And this is going to take focus, intentionality, and you saying, no, that is not something I need to devote time to right now. Simplify your public image is the second thing that we're going to talk about tonight. Proverbs says, a good name is better than great riches. Simplifying your public image is really about simplifying the story you tell about yourself, but more importantly, it is also the story others are going to tell about you. So ask yourself, what story do I want people telling about me? Now simplify how you tell that story so a stranger can easily repeat it. Now a little later, we're going to be giving you a guide to download that walks you through how to do this. Reduce the words you use to tell your story by 75%. That might sound hard, but if you're intentional, this kind of becomes just second nature. And criticize every platform. You have a limited amount of time. 
So many of you are freelancers and small business owners who don't have the time and resources necessary to effectively utilize every platform to build your business. So Facebook, Google Ads, Twitter, blogging, SEO, Instagram, Pinterest, Yelp, Thumbtack, Home Advisors, MailChimp, Constant Contact, I could go on, right? Which means you're gonna waste your time and money trying to do all of it. So simplify, don't do it. That is always an option, but we rarely give ourselves permission to simply say, no, I'm not going to do that because my time is better spent elsewhere. No sacred cows. The truth is, you have to be willing to scuttle your best ideas. Good ideas age, systems deteriorate, and they are deteriorating at a faster and faster pace. Your good ideas that worked well yesterday will probably not work tomorrow. And when your ideas get in the way of your goal, kill it or modify it and then move on. Mm -hmm. Complexity creates a decision tax and it always reduces value, which is why you need to be willing to kill or simplify anything that starts causing complexity. By making it simple, you're increasing the value added that you provide. By doing this, your service becomes more valuable to your customer. So you service their piano, you made it sound great, and you save them time in the process. Simplify your logistics. And this is where we're gonna spend a good amount of our time tonight. Uh, so let's talk about the practicals. What do you need to do and how do you need to do it? Well, right off the bat, Tim, don't manufacture dead weight by settling for something that is too complex. That's worth repeating. Don't manufacture dead weight. When you become aware of the need for simplicity, you suddenly start to realize that we're really good at making things complex. It takes focus and intentionality to refine something to a state of effective simplicity. So voicemail, right? Okay, kind of crazy. Is it really needed? Now the simplest thing to say would be, I don't do voicemail. But wait, you know, won't I lose customers? Maybe, perhaps. But if you choose not to do voicemail, you'll not lose the good ones. Because this is 2019, right? And there are better ways to communicate. They can email, they can text, they can live chat, schedule online with Gazelle 24 seven. Do you really want a customer who needs you to offer voicemail? So just record a message that says, thanks for calling, email me. I don't use voicemail anymore. Another option is to pay for a call answering service that answers uh, every call from 6 a.m. To, to 9 p.m. So at a minimum, if you decide that voicemail is worth having, then you need to set expectations for your clients, right? Thanks for calling. I'm able to respond faster if you send me an email or text to this email. Just imagine a world where you don't ever have to listen to a voicemail again. How much time would that free up for you? And, and now you can focus on more important things. And this is what we're talking about, about making it easier for you to do business with you. Presenting services and discussing a piano's needs with a customer is perhaps the number one place piano techs overcomplicate things. The easiest thing to do is to use the customer's vocabulary to tell the story of the piano, which means you cannot use words like action, regulation, voicing, whipping, punching, etc. Because a punching is abuse. A whipping is a form of torture. Action is a verb and uh, not a noun, sorry. Regulation is something the government does and voicing is just confusing. Does the piano actually talk to you? Right, all of these words mean something different to the average person. Now, the best way we found to present services is to simply say, listen, your piano was built for this level of performance and it's currently performing at this level. And it's gonna take X so much dollars to get it up to its peak performance. So how do you wanna approach the service on this piano? And then you shut up. And you let the client ask the questions. Then you use the words they say as part of your answer. So after our last webinar, we had a few technicians write back and tell us that they sold over $12,000 worth of work the following week using this approach. 
it's incredibly effective. The point is the client doesn't need to be a professional. That's why they hired you. All they need is to have just enough information to make a decision. If you complicate this too much, you will introduce a decision tax and it is going to cost you lost revenue because you made it too complex. I mean, seriously, think about what George just said. What could be more simple? Your piano has this level of performance potential. It's not performing at that level. So how do you want to approach this? Without saying it, you are actually asking, what level of performance do you need? And you are reinforcing that I'm the professional who knows everything you need to know about how to make your piano perform better. Done. They can make a decision with that information because we didn't overcomplicate things. All right, so here's a fun one. Shrink your service area. Just tell folks, listen, sorry, I don't go that far. Now you can use your free time to build deeper relationships with the people who matter in the areas that you do do service. So how small is too small? Well, I, I'm willing to bet that whatever you have currently is too big. Now this is an important part of saying no. You'll almost always earn more money focusing on a smaller area than you will earn by making it too big. So pricing. Your fear of losing Money, if you raise prices, is irrational. There, we said it, okay? We did an entire webinar on this, so you can watch it in our archives. Um, so we won't cover this here. But suffice to say, you need to simplify your pricing model. And as soon as you do that, you'll earn more money. And get rid of travel charges. Uh, this is easy to do when you shrink your service area. But get rid of all the cart options, charge one price to show up, then once you evaluate the piano, offer to solve their problem for one fixed price. Well, what if the problem, uh, what if the job takes longer and I lose money? Okay, well, your fear of losing money again is irrational. You'll make more money this way. And if you happen to lose money on one out of 10 jobs, then remember the other nine should have been profitable enough to account for those mistakes. And you're paying for your own education here. Say no to services that are outside your expertise. Remember that fear you experienced a moment ago about losing money uh, because something might take longer than you expected, so you need to be really careful with how you quote things to make sure you can account for every scenario out there? No. Uh, if you have that fear, it's because you were not an expert in that specific area. Otherwise, you would have known exactly how much to charge. I've been servicing pianos for over almost two decades now, and I still feel this. I'll walk up to a piano and I use this to guide me, right? Because I start thinking like, oh, well, I, I should charge this and I should add this big buffer over here. And I think, wait, whoa, no, 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 this is outside my expertise. I just need to walk away, right? So this means that you need to just charge a consultation fee and walk away from some pianos. That is fine. And this is also really, really simple, right? You show up. You tell them what's wrong. You tell them who can fix it. You charge a consultation fee and you go back to focusing on doing the services that make you money because you are a professional in those areas. Website. So the easiest way to simplify your website is to reduce the page count by 75%. And then you're gonna reduce the words on the remaining pages by 75%. Now, this is your starting point, but the more you cut, the better. You know, George, a funny thing happened. The more I deleted content on Well-Loved Piano's website when I went through this process, uh, the more people told me how in-depth my website was, how easy it was to navigate, how immensely helpful our website was, and how that played a role in their choice to do business with us. You know, so we essentially went through our entire website and story branded every aspect of it that we could. And the more we cut, the more people told us how wonderful and how much more helpful it was. When you remove the noise, they can actually get to the things they need. Yeah. And marketing. So one of the ways you're going to simplify your marketing is by getting out of the platforms you're not going to be effective with. So instead, 
you're going to empower others to share your story by making your story simple and easy to understand. So you're going to make yourself the guide and your client the hero. Now, this isn't a marketing webinar, so we don't have time to dive into this in depth. And the guide we're going to give you to download, we'll talk about this a little. Yeah, and the guide that we're going to give you is just a really big checklist. It has reading material, has a lot of other things that you can go invest in your time with areas that you feel like you want to hit. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's talk about payroll. Um, even if you are a solo freelancer, simplify your payroll, right? Choose to pay yourself X percent of all revenue and use the rest to run your business. And this will help break the unhealthy connection you as the business owner have in your brain that says you get to keep everything you earn. It isn't true, not even when you own your own business. Now, do the same thing when you hire an employee, right? You have a fixed amount that you are able to pay for labor that you've been paying yourself. Uh, now, fit your dollars for labor and pay that to your employees in the form of their compensation. Uh, it's a defined percent of revenue. It's really simple. And we'll cover this more in detail in a future webinar on hiring your first employee. Uh, but payroll is one of those areas where even as a one man show, you really need to start thinking about simplifying it. And this is like a five minute decision. I'm gonna keep 79% of all the revenue in my personal bank account and the other 31% goes into funding the expenses the business has, right? Great, go do it. Um, now tools, uh, tools are another area and tools are just expensive. Uh, so simplify your tool set. Right, by doing this, you also will simplify the services you can perform. You physically can't do a job because you don't have the tool. You choose not to own the tool. Right, I decided to repair digital pianos once because people were constantly calling me and asking, you know, I thought I could, you know, and there was nobody else in the area. I think somebody had retired and moved out because all of a sudden I started getting all these calls. And I thought, well, I can make money at this. And I was right, but I hated the work. And they were typically not great clients. So I tossed all the tools and now I smile every single time somebody calls and asks me to work on a digital piano. But I did this with my action cart as well. I used to carry a shop cart with me just in case I got to an old piano and I needed to flip it on his back that day so I didn't have to make a separate trip out. Well, it turns out it was really hard lugging that whole thing around and I probably spent more in gas uh, than I did making money on it. Uh, by the end of the year. And so I just decided, you know, I'm putting it in the shop. That's why it's called a shop cart. And if I need to take it to a client's house, I'm going to book another appointment. and I'm going to charge for that appointment because it is not worth it to me to lug this thing around just so I can make a day chaotic by trying to squeeze too much in. It simplified my life immensely when I could just look at the client and say, I need to schedule another appointment for this. Uh, now you can also achieve the same thing by intentionally leaving some tools. I'm not talking about uh, your tuning lever. <laughs> I'm not talking about you know, some repair things. You don't wanna be up a creek, but go through your tool set and just ask, have I used you in the last five, six months? Do I really need to carry you around just for that one-off opportunity? No, you probably don't. Make your life easier. All right, so here's a fun one. Simplify your customers. You should be able to smell a bad customer from a mile away. So trust your gut and memorize this phrase. Ready? I would love to be able to help you, but I don't think I'm able to do everything you're asking. I would, re I would recommend calling an XYZ company and see if they're able to provide what you're looking for. Just simplify your customers. Payment processing. Uh, yes, we accept all forms of payment. There's nothing simpler than that. American Express, yeah. Cash, yes. Which would you prefer, a check or a card? Whichever makes it easier for you. Now, choose to accept whatever payment the client offers. Hey, what about Bitcoin? Mm, no, not Bitcoin, then laugh and tell them it's not real money yet, unless you're actually dealing in Bitcoin. Right. So uh, should I charge a fee to cover that three to four percent that I'm going to get hit as a business? No, just raise all your rates. 
It's a cost of doing business, done. Now everything is easy, you charge everybody the same price, it's simple. And people who give you a check now feel like a hero for helping you save money because they're not costing you money. But people who pay with a card don't feel gypped because they were charged more. That's right. Employee tasks. So if you're looking to hire an employee, don't make their life a living hell if you want to keep them. So you make their job super simple, right? You do X, Y, and Z. That's it. Anything more complicated than that is too complicated. Keep it simple for them and for you. Now, simplicity is about freeing up your time. So running a simple business is easier and takes less time from you, the owner. You'll smile more, you'll be happier, and you'll have less stress. And don't be afraid to cut. There is a high likelihood you're watching this webinar because you feel your business is too complex, but you're afraid of making the wrong decision. Well, what if I get rid of this? What if I get rid of that? Uh, fear of anything that cannot eat you is probably overrated. Now, you should feel some good fear at the thought of changing systems that you're very comfortable with, but that isn't the, it's only helpful up to a limit. Right? Fear is a good thing when you use it as a guide to make better decisions, but let it guide you. But don't let it stop you from simplifying your business and making the cuts that you need to make to keep it simple. And check this out. This paragraph is on every single one of your websites in some version or another. It has 71 words, but I can say all of this better in nine words. So listen to how your client's brain skims this paragraph. They don't read it, they skim it quickly, right? And so it's like, okay, so pianos need regular service to sound their best, tuning, regulation, ooh, I don't know that word. Now, this is the point at which their brain starts checking out. They're gone, they, they have not gotten anything from that much, and so they just start skimming. All right, essential services, worked a lot, my piano, RPT, extensive resume, oh shoot, I have to call the schedule. No, I can email. Oh, look, I can schedule online. Hmm, which one should I choose? But what if I can't find something online? I guess I could always call. What time is it? Uh, is it their business hours? Where are their business hours? I, okay, I don't see their business hours on here. Um, all right, I think I'm, I'm just going to click and see what happens. Wow. That is confusing. And 100% what really happens. So you can say everything you need in these nine words. I make your piano sound better. Schedule online today. There's only one call to action. It's not that the other words don't matter, right? They matter, and they matter really to you. They just don't need to be front and center because they confuse the client and they make it hard for their brain to compute all those choices. This is a classic example of a decision tax. Now you thought you were helping the client by convincing them that you're trustworthy, you're certified, you're educated, you know how to do all these things, but instead you confuse them by overloading their brain with too many words. Now, maybe you want more than these nine words. I understand. But understand your client's brain doesn't need any more than this to make its decision. Every word you add potentially adds a decision tax. And too much is going to kill your sale. So this is true in your website, and this is also true in your conversations. So don't be afraid to cut content, and don't be afraid to reduce words. The more you cut, the more your business will grow. Now, the last thing we're going to cover is how to compete using simplicity. So 20 years ago, nobody was online, so this stuff didn't matter, right? But today, like we said, your competition is everything and everyone in the world, not just the other piano tuners in your city. And he who has the most clarity will win. So you can build an amazing website for your business, but without clarity, you're gonna be part of the problem, not the solution. So instead, you're gonna focus on making it clear, simple, and use as few words as possible to help your client make a decision to trust you and a decision to book and a decision to stop looking everywhere else. 
That decision, by the way, to stop looking somewhere else is the most important decision people are going to make when they're on your website, right? Because if I take in all that information, but I never decide to stop shopping, I'm going to go somewhere else and I'm just going to see what's out there. That is key. So simplifying your business model is a process, not an event, right? You need to sim uh, systematically go through every single aspect of your business and just ask, how can I make this more simple? So pick an area, work on it, move on to the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, and so on. And some of these, it's, it's like this, right? You look at something, you go, how can I make you more simple? And it's like, whoa, why didn't I ever ask that before? I just need to do this and this. And boom, your life gets better, right? So, you know, do this for one hour a week. And after a few years, you will find that your business is on its way to 3Xing whatever your revenue you're doing today. Simplicity is literally your only option. Because everything else isn't going to work if you don't have simplicity. Choose to simplify. Being focused and intentional is a choice, but you have to make the choice. This isn't going to happen by accident. Focus your efforts. Trying to do too many things at once will result in never achieving any of it. Simplify your logistics. Each individual task takes very little time to execute. So a few things uh, that we've talked about here might take hours, right? So we talked about like getting rid of 75% of the content on your website. If you're like me, when I went to my website, I think I had 132 pages. It took a lot to figure out what to cut, but eventually I just went delete, 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 delete. I took a big breath and I looked at what was left. Right, so uh, mo but most of these things are very easy to do and will take a very short amount of time uh, and a very, very, very small amount of action. And like Tim just said, really, don't be afraid to cut. Don't be afraid to cut your words, your web pages, your marketing. Fear of the wrong things will always leave you in a rut. Eliminate your sacred cows. They keep you stuck in your rut and they actually never pull you out. And so, you know, if you think about it, we hold on to these things and, you know, there are parts of them. So take um, yellow page ads from years ago, right? It, those were actually helpful because they forced you to use 15 words to explain yourself and differentiate yourself. Using additional words costs a lot of money. Well, now with the internet, people got to use as many words as they wanted and everybody went out and made the same mistake, right? And so your sacred cows are the same thing. These are your really good ideas that worked for you 20, 30, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or even last year. Well, now you find your business is growing and changing and all these other things. And so I can look at marketing and say, well, that yellow page ad, there was an element of that that worked really well. The yellow pages didn't work. But the idea of simplicity did. So I'm going to keep the simplicity, but I'm going to get rid of yellow pages. It's the same with your other ideas. I'm going to keep part of this other idea, and then I'm going to uh, move over and migrate and take an aspect of it, but everything else goes away. So you're going to choose your business's service identity and value-added approach. Now, we didn't have time to talk about this in depth during the webinar, but it's in the handout. So Luke, uh, go ahead and, and put that ahead and post that in the channel if you can right now. That'd be great. Thanks, Luke. Remember, simplicity is the first step to everything you want to achieve. So while we transition to the Q&A, Luke sorts through the questions. Um, here's a list of upcoming webinars that we're going to be doing very soon. Uh, we'll be covering every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. Uh, the team at Gazelle are excited to help you find the tools you need to save your time and wow your customers so you can focus on growing your business and doing what you enjoy most. George, I'm going to, before Luke starts the Q&A, um, let's, let's go back to that topic a moment ago um, on full service versus a la carte. 
Yeah. Um, I didn't think that we were going to have much time to cover this. So let's dive into this just a little bit here uh, because I think we're going to get some questions on it. That's good. Uh, and yeah. Luke, you can kind of filter out those questions or not filter them out, but process the questions and uh, pick up when we're done here. Uh, I just want to start with just a working definition of full service versus a la carte. Uh, these are two different service models uh, within the piano tuning world, right? The traditional model is a la carte. You call me and say, do you tune pianos? And I say, yes, and I show up. And now when I get there, I need to talk to you about pitch raising. I need to talk to you about cleaning. I need to talk to you about regulating. I need to talk to you about voicing. And you might tell me, no thanks, just tune the piano. And that's it. Full service uh, tends to be done by more concert level technicians and people who've been in the field for a while. They eventually get really, really tired of tuning a bunch of dirty, grimy pianos that are no fun to play. And they start realizing like, wow, I can provide a lot more value by telling clients, hey, I'm actually gonna do this full service model. And so there's this whole group of people out there that do full service. And full service, usually you're showing up, it's a block of time, a big block of time, usually like two hours or more. And you're going to tune, pitch raise, regulate, voice, and clean. Um, and you're going to get through more service on that instrument. And the idea is you want the instrument to perform better, not just sound better. And so these are kind of two juxtaposed models because in one model, you just say, yes, I can come. And in the other model, you really have to fight to differentiate yourself. Um, so if, you know, we're going to take some time during the Q and A to actually talk about that a little bit more, I think since we have time. So if you have questions on how those two models work and specifically how to market those two models, um, I've done both models and we've actually counseled and advised people on how to successfully run both models in our work here at Gazelle. Uh, and so we'll be happy to answer those questions for you. Great, thanks Tim, I'm glad you actually had the chance to fit that in as well. All right, Luke, how are we doing on? All right, yeah, so we've had some uh, questions filter in here throughout uh, the webinar and feel free uh, as we're going through this, um, uh, if you have other questions, there's that Q&A button down at the bottom of your screen. You can click on that and submit a question or just use the chat window there as well. Um, we're monitoring those. All right, so um, I've organized these, uh, put these into some, some groups and categories of what we've had come in so far. Um, so we had a couple of questions come in about uh, the website when you were talking about simplifying the website. Um, do you recommend placing pricing on your website? Uh, I'll jump into that. Um, yes and no, it depends. Mostly, yes. I'll, I'll give you the, my thought process on each, and then George, I'll let you jump in. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't put the pricing on the website, the client is going to have to call. They're going to have to make an assumption. They're going to have to make their decision incomplete. They don't have all the information they need to just go to the website, boom, 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 that's inside my budget, pick up the phone, call, book online, you're done, right? So if you have your, your pricing on your website, you've enabled your clients, you've actually simplified their life because I'm busy and it's 11 p.m. and I'm finally remembering I wanted to call the piano tuner out this week and I don't know who to call. And so I'm gonna go in there and do my research and boom, 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 boom. And I wanna make a decision now. Well, if you have the prices there, it's really easy. Uh, it's challenging if you have the prices there because it means you have to present your services in a way that is simple, it's clear, and that a, you know, the curse of knowledge that George talked about earlier. Um, you know, if you, if you make it too complex, they're just going to be confused and leave because they don't know what to do, right? So put some prices on there, maybe not all of them, but you need to help them make the decision. Um, that being said, there are some areas where it makes sense not to put your prices on your website. Uh, one would be services that are too complex to simplify. Don't put those prices on there. Uh, another would be if you are the most expensive in your area by a long shot. I don't know anybody. 
<laughs> who fits that <laughs> fits that boat, right? Well, up to piano, and I've been in that boat for probably eight years now, and I've done both. I chose not to put them on, and I chose to put them on. Currently, they're on our website, and I can tell you that in both cases, it's kind of like a restaurant without prices on the menu. If you need to ask the price, you can't afford it. That's how people approach it. And so that is a great way to filter out clients, take your prices off and they just kind of go, well, hey, I'm, I'm picking him, not his price, right? That's a, that's a great reason too. Um, and if you're the most expensive in the area, you just need to be prepared that if you don't have prices on your website, the first question everybody is gonna ask is how much do you charge? And the main reason I chose to put prices on the website was I got tired of asking the wrong question first. I wanted them to call in and say, I hear you're the guys that make my piano easier to play. And I say, yes, we are. Right. And so by putting prices on there, I got past that. So now the people that reach out to us and book uh, have all the information they need to make a, make a decision. And that was an easy thing. I was trying to make it easier for them. Uh, that was a long answer, but no, George, no, it's good. And Tim, I think the thing I want to highlight about your answer is that, almost the entirety of your answer starts from an audience's perspective, right? You said to yourself, who's the audience I'm reaching out to? How am I communicating with them? And what are the questions they're asking? Right? So you're right. People get to that website. How long will this take? When are they available? How much will this cost? What, what are the answers that they need immediately? And who is this person that I'm trying to reach as my client? So I think with the person who asked this question of, do I put my pricing on my website? Well, let me ask you this. Do your clients need you to have the pricing on the website? And take yourself into their shoes and start asking yourself, where is it that they need? And how do I remove all the noise so they can get what they need faster? Yeah, and I, let me add to that. One of the things that adds to the noise is when you go, well, I, if I was buying this service, I, I would want yeah. that. Well, the, the problem is you stopped asking what your clients wanted and you started assuming that you are your customer. You're not your customer. I'm actually not my customer. Most of my customers buy $80,000 pianos. Right. I'm not that person. Right. Even if I had the chance to buy an $80,000 piano, I don't know if I would. I'm a piano tech. I'll go buy the $5,000 version and rebuild it. Right. I don't need to spend all that money. Right. I'm not my customer. And so if you're trying to approach how you present yourself by asking, well, how would I want this presented? You're almost starting at the wrong spot. Yes, yes. do unto others as you would have them do to you. That, you know, the golden rule applies, but you also need to consider that your customers might, their needs are probably vastly different than your needs. Okay, um, still another question about the website. Uh, this guy says, uh, I'm an RPT. Um, are you saying that I should not advertise that on my website? So, I, I, I'll jump in here for a moment. Um, the general customer does not know what an RPT is. I, I've said it, I've said it. Um, so what they're looking at rarely now a, a educated customer will be looking for that, but the general customer. And so again, you have to ask yourself, what's the customer you're going for? Um, Tim, would you add to that? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to add that with absolutely. It depends on how you're selling it. If you're just going to dump the words RPT on your website, like everybody's going to know what it is. No, don't put it on there. It does almost nothing. Put it on your business card, put it in the junk drawer, put it in your bio, um, you know, put it on the bio page somewhere. So, you know, be honest about your certifications. But the reality is the way you market the RPT is this. You simply tell people the RPT is the highest possible standard for the last 60 years for what it means to be a qualified piano technician. I am that person. That's all you need to say. All you need to really convey is I have attained the highest possible standard in the entire world when it comes to certification. It's called the RPT and it's put on through the guild, right? And so if you're gonna present it that way, 
then find a way to weave that into your story. But if you're just going to put on there, registered <laughs> piano technician passed exams, I'm like, what does that do for me? Not much if I'm your customer. I'm confused. Or worse, just putting RPT. Yeah. <laughs> because those, those three letters d mean very little to the customer. Unless registered piano technician, that, now we're starting to get it, the meaning of it. We started to remove the jargon of it and started to get into what it might mean to you, the customer. Yeah. And, you know, you also have to consider, um, I'm an RPT, so I think I can speak some to the history of the, uh, of the trade organization as a whole. It's a volunteer organization that has relied very heavily on its members promoting this standard. Well, we have now thousands of people promoting it in their own way. So it, in a way, too, it's not like the AMA and a doctor, right? I know what a doctor of internal medicine is required to do. I have this picture in my head that it's eight years of schooling and a lot more schooling, right? Uh, but that's because somebody else did the marketing for them. And so, you know, again, if you are going to market it better than everybody else is, yes, put it on there. Okay, we have a couple of questions about pricing um, when you're talking about simplifying your pricing. Um, how do you switch customers that have a long-term relationship with you in, in one model of business, but you're moving to a different model, specifically a la carte to full service? How do you handle customers that you already have that were on the a la carte, but you want to move to full service. Sorry, there's communication problems here between George and I. Uh, I'll let you take I'll, that, Tim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. I'll jump and then you, you can say what you're yep. gonna say. Um, the, you can go for friction and you can go for not friction. I tend to wanna make it easy for people. So if, if you're trying to simplify your business and make it easy for people, and then you make it difficult by having to now defend yourself and explain why you raised rates and all this stuff, right? I'm just saying, if you raise rates on everybody and don't grandfather them, be prepared to have it be more complex. So from that standpoint, I would say grandfather them. But it kind of depends on where your rates are right now. You know, for some of you, if, if you're just doing a 20% or 30% price hike, you probably could just raise rates on everybody and nobody would really notice um, or say anything. So that would be the right choice. Um, George, did you have something to add no, to that? I was actually gonna talk about grandfather, but I think you just covered it. Um, and I was gonna plug, of course, the pricing webinar we did. But yeah. Tim, could you actually speak more specifically to the question of shifting from a la carte to a full service model? Yeah. Um, the idea of it is far bigger than I gave it credit for when I first started trying to make that shift. And so um, I think the hardest thing about it was the marketing. I was really good at marketing, uh, the story, the marketing and the story. I had a story and I knew how to share my story with people as an a la carte service provider. It was really easy. Well, now I was having to tell a different story, a different price, and market completely differently because by shifting the model, I shifted my ideal customer. And it was that friction between the customers where I was like, wait a minute, something's different here and it's not working the way that I thought it would. And so it, you do need this like leeway time where it's like you can't throw away all your current customers and make the shift. Few people have those resources. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Right, just raise your rates on everybody and move forward, right? And if 80% you know, of your customers go away, hey, uh, well, right? That's probably the easiest way to do it, but some of you might not be able to financially sustain that. So you kind of need to grandfather people and make that transition slowly. But the other thing I did was I grandfathered people for far too long. I was so concerned with it that I, I looked back years later and I hadn't brought everybody up fast enough. And so I had already shifted the model, shifted the marketing, shifted the story. Well, now I have attention. I have my, my it, people in my tribe, in the tribe of people I've been marketing to, and I have all these old customers that are no longer in my tribe and they all had their special rate. <laughs> it was confusing for me. It was confusing every time I hired an office staff. 
it was confusing every single time I personally went. Many of these people were pre-Gazelle, so I didn't have a written record in my hands of what I charged last. Now I can just pull up Gazelle and go, oh, okay, you've been with me. Oh, look, <laughs> you're on that rate, right? I have that information in my hand. But it's, it's work on my part. And the hardest thing was training office staff, though, because they look at you like, okay, so you charge how much for a service? And you say, okay, well, it's this much for a service. And then, oh, but, but there's this group of people, and there's this group of people. And there's that client and, and their eyes start going, oh my goodness, how am I going to tell all these people apart? Um, you know, so uh, I think I went off on a rabbit trail. What was your original <laughs> question, Luke? Uh, I, I think you answered it. It was yeah. about how to um, grandfather okay. customers. Uh, we have another uh, question about pricing here. Um, what is the best way to simplify a quote for what a client uh, for what a client's piano needs after an evaluation? Is it best to give bundle prices or simply quote what level they would like to uh, like the piano to play at? You're going to be so good at knowing what it takes because now you've simplified your model. So you're offering what you're good at, what you're an expert in. And you know how long that takes. So that when you get to that point where you say, hey, your piano could be here. It's currently here. What would you like to do? And they say, well, how about here? Well, then you know what's well, going to take this and this and this. I know how long that takes me. And you might have your hourly rate in your head and you can just say, well, that's going to take X so much money. So you're not going to break down that. You're going to tell them exactly how, what, how much money it's going to take to get from where they are today to where they want to be. And uh, we explain how to do that more in our pricing. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we do cover this a lot in the pricing webinar, but um, the key is to listen. That moment when George, you know, said, you know, your piano was built for this, is currently performing here. It's going to take this much to get it to its peak performance. How do you want to approach that? And now you shut up. Yeah. You need to listen. And what you're listening for is those words to understand where that client's at. As yeah. soon as you start to identify where they're at, you need to ask yourself, what price am I willing to do that work for? to get it from where it's at to halfway or where it's at, you kind of already told them what it was to be the full price. So if they're needing anything less than that, you need to pull a quote, you know, out of the top of your head right there or know what you're going to say. Cause you have to look them in the eye and say, okay, great. Well, if you want it to perform at that level, it's going to be this price and you need to be confident in that. And so you gain confidence in two ways. One, you're not doing any services that are outside your wheelhouse and outside your expertise, right? And so you are just choosing not to do that. And so you're telling people, hey, I, I can't do all that work. I can't do belly work rebuilding, but I do know who can, and I'm going to charge you a consultation fee today. And if I want to do that work, I'll go learn how to do that work. Um, or you can choose to take a risk and lose money on it, knowing full well that is your tuition to the school of hard knocks. And you can say, well, I was gonna charge you $2,000 to do all of it, and you pointed in the middle, so it's a thousand bucks. Well, it was probably 1,600, so you lost 600 bucks, right? So is, is it really the end of the day? No. Um, but the idea being, if you put yourself in their shoes, the moment you start saying, this or never finish that sentence between this and never finish that sentence. If you're needing to say that sentence, you're introducing complexity. So just say one price, you know, I can get it there for this price that takes care of everything to get it to that level. So the, the second part of his question there was, do you give them a bundle price or do you quote, individual things. I think you just answered that at the end right there. You said, just give them one price and say, and you just cover everything in that one price to get them where they need to be. Yes. I also use a gazelle condition report. I, I have that already put out that has the itemized list of everything and I can just tap a button and email it to them. Uh, so I do itemize everything, but when I'm talking to the customer, when I'm getting them to commit to doing a certain amount of work, I don't go into the weeds and the details. I just say this price, boom, done. And I would, I would challenge everybody to really take a step back and listen more when you're getting service for other things that you do. Like there are things that our mechanics 
I think about car mechanics. And our, our car mechanics do this all the time, and we don't bat our eyes, right? So we walk in and they say, well, you're at the 25,000 mile rate. So uh, this will just pay this much flat rate. We're going to do all the work to make your car run. And the minute they started creating their 25,000 mile rates, their 50,000 mile, their 100,000 mile, you know, fix it moments, people just started paying it because suddenly they didn't have to think about, oh, that's an oil change and a transmission because they removed all the jargon out of it and they got it to something people understood. How many miles has my car been driven? How much work does it need? You're going to make it work, right? And I pay you a flat rate. And that's, I think that's ultimately what Tim's really explaining here is the ability to give a very easy to understand, flat, this is what you're going to pay to get your piano back up to speed. Okay, we've got another uh, similar question here. Um, if you're doing a full service model, how do you differentiate in the customer's mind what would be included in that static block of time versus extra regulation, voicing, et cetera, uh, that the piano needs to be at its best? So I think he's asking, what would you include in the you said you go for two hours of time. What would you include in that versus some, if they need more, how would you um, add that to it? Yeah, uh, I'm the piano technician here, so I'll speak to that. Um, I chose to sell it as a block of time because customers understand time. That's where I started. Okay, great. So now it's a two hour block of time. I'm there to make your piano better. And I tell them, right, this, this whole appointment is going to cover everything you need, your tuning, your seasonal service. By the way, I started calling it seasonal service, not regulation voicing. <laughs> and so now it's tuning, seasonal service. And then if they really ask, it, that, that's basically regulation voicing, cleaning, and all these other things, it, it's, gonna, it's gonna do that. Now, all of my customers that I've serviced for a long time, I know how long it's going to take. I can get it in there and out. I can do a partial pitch raise in an area, the tuning, the cleaning, and some voicing and regulation uh, in two hours. So, you know, within an hour to an hour 15, you're done with any tuning that you need. And then that frees me up to have 45 minutes to do everything else. Um, so I don't talk to the customer about that. I show up, I get to work, and I do the work. Um, but on a new customer, I say this a lot. Well, you booked a two hour appointment today. I don't have enough time to do all of this. So instead of saying, you know, you booked a two hour appointment and it, it needs a lot of regulation and voicing and all this other stuff, I just say, listen, based off of where you want to get the piano, because we already covered that, I don't have enough time to get it there today. So how about I, I use this full two hours to get there, and then I need to book another half day, full day, or two full days of work to get it there for that one price I quoted earlier. Um, the, I'm, I'm very rarely ever talking to the customer about all that stuff. Um, they don't really know what I include in that two hours. All they know is they sit down at their piano and they're done and they say, wow, this is so much easier to play and it sounds great. Cool. We had um, uh, Ty Uphoff is in the chat and he made a comment uh, that I, I thought was excellent. I wanted to share. Um, he said, everyone who thinks that they have, quote, educated their client by describing their $500 service in depth, that client just told the next tech that you rebuilt their piano. They don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's absolutely true. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, we have a couple questions about service areas here. Um, uh, so it, it, we had this at the beginning of the webinar. We were talking about service areas. Um, one of the things that you mentioned of simplifying was to shrink your service area. So how can shrinking my service area make me more money? Um, we, we mentioned that little phrase there. Um, that seems counterintuitive. What if there aren't enough people to fill my schedule? Well, first off, it gives you time to take every single music minister out to lunch. Right. So initially, if there's really not that much work there, you can go really deep with the people who are in that area. And I'm willing to bet that if you build relationships with those people, you'll find that you can live in that service area. Um, I, I'm going to let you speak to whatever you want, George, in a minute. But um, what I would do is instead of like making this uh, black and white, like either this or this, 
think about this in relationship to your home, okay? You want to invest more of your time with people who are closer to you and less time with people who are further out. And so now you can draw a line and say, okay, well, I want to spend, you know, 80% of my time investing in the people who are within 20 minutes of me. And I want to spend 20 minutes of my time investing in the people who are 20 to 60 minutes from me. Well, if you exhaust that 20 minutes and you don't have a business that's thriving, bump it out to 30, then bump it out. But don't go out to 40 before you've actually refined this whole area right here. And so it's a matter of just time and investment put in there. That's how you're going to earn more. Um, there's always that question of, are there enough people and pianos in that area? But what do you want to add to that? Oh, no, Tim, I think you actually covered exactly what I was going to say there. I think, um, I think really the question is, how much, how, how much tighter can you get it? Like if we're talking five minutes, so the farther out you go, you're still using your time, right? And so the question is, yes, you used Gazelle to help yourself make those schedules so much tighter than they used to be. But if you start tightening up by five minutes, five minutes, then you'll have more time to take more closer. And I think, Tim, you covered how that would work and how, how to build those relationships in there. Yeah. You know, this is also interconnected. Because if you are trying to simplify your prices and you have these complex uh, travel charges, right. well, if it's within the I-40 corridor, it's this price. And if it goes here, it's this price. And if it goes here, it's this price, right? And, and you're going to invest time in simplifying that. The easiest thing to do is to get rid of the travel charge. Well, now you're forced with the choice. Do I, sh do I compensate by shrinking the area? Or do I raise all rates to make sure I can go to this area? Those are two different choices. And the easiest thing to do is to say, but then it's really confusing. And a lot of people stop there because they get scared. And they're like, oh, well, hold on. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I can charge that much for this area. And I don't know if I can live off this area. So I'm going to do nothing. And now I'm going to keep my very complex way of doing business. That's the worst decision that you can possibly make. You'd be better off to shrink and bump it out by 10 minutes or come here and then lower and shrink in later. Um, you'd be off way better off to do that than to keep doing some complex, uh, crazy pricing scheme that you've got going to help travel for gas. Okay, thanks. Um... We had another question come in and said, I'm just starting out, how big should I make my service area? But I think you just answered that. You start small and grow it as you need to because you want yeah. it as compact as possible. You know, um, start, uh, yes, yeah. If you, were, if you were just starting your business, um, I would literally like just be doing circles around my house and getting further and further and further out you know, with each passing week. In one week, I could probably go find every piano within one mile of my house. And it's probably few enough that I can knock on everybody's door, right? But five miles from my house, I can't. So, you know, yes, you know, start local and then grow. Okay, we had a couple other questions about um, uh, simplifying the way you do business. Um, so one was, would you recommend hiring an office assistant or a call answering service? So basically in-house or, or outsourcing. That's a really good question. Um, and I think really, are you if you're just talking about answering the phone, that's one thing. Um, but those are two totally different services and to totally different needs. So I'd actually want to know more about what you're trying to solve, what problem you're trying to solve by adding one of those two things. Yeah. Um, if I'm going to make it easy for me to do business with me or for me to run my business, do the call answering service first. They, they don't talk to customers long. It's literally pick up the phone. Hi. Okay. And then they're going to schedule a time for you to call the customer back and answer that. You're just going to get an email that says, 
Sally called on this date at this time. She has this question, wants you to call her back Thursday at 2 p.m. Right, that's all it is. And so it, it does, it frees your time up so that you don't, you know, it's just easier because then you just put it on your schedule and you call her back Thursday at 2 p.m. But that's all it is. So it's really easy to get that up and going. Um, so you could spin that up in a matter of 48 hours. And now you have calls being answered between 6 and 9 p.m. And now you can go focus on building your business and doing the other things that matter. But there does come a time when you need somebody who can actually go do the work and book the appointment. And so I think a lot of that, it's hard to know, like, okay, how big is your business? Where are you at? Uh, are you at a transition point in your business? Or do you have a lot of space to grow? Um, and so if you're capping out all of your resources and you physically don't have the time to also pick up the phone and book the appointment, right. um, you know, but the call answering service, make it easy. Uh, tell them when they ask for a call back, tell them all of our booking is done online. There. There you go. Right. You know, I'm happy to call you back and answer your question, but all of our booking is done online. Okay. That's easy. And if, if people are reinforcing that, then that's what they expect. And they go online and they book. Sometimes people just need to be told, go online. I, I, I'm not going to do it, right? And so uh, at that point, the call answering service could scale up and work for quite a while. Um, I'm trying to, George, can you think of a, a downside to using that call answering service? Um, well, I think that, if there are other needs that you have, like when somebody says that they are thinking about hiring an office assistant, um, then the only question I would have there is, are you looking, what are you looking for that person to do? And if the answer is, well, I want them to answer the phones. Well, then yeah, call answering service is the answer. Um, but if you have, and, and, and business models may range, you might have another reason why you, I can't think of one right now, um, of why you would say you need that. Invoicing, but you should, that you can, if you're using Gazelle, you're able to do that right then and there and send that email. Yeah, I think if you're hiring an office assistant, but really you're trying to hire a business manager, don't right. call her an office, don't call them yes. an office assistant, right? Uh, office assistants handle a lot of things, but if you need to hire a business manager, don't hire a call answering service, hire a business manager and have him work the office and manage it for you. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I would just start with name, the the role the right thing yes <laughs> yes right let's start there um and now if there's this one aspect of the role that's answering the phones maybe you outsource that piece um and you in-house the others um and, so. and tim tim i'll say that the place where i've seen this most often right is when a tech uh you know it's a male tech and he's got uh, and his wife has been running the, the business on the side right as and in his mind, she's the office assistant, but really she's been the business manager and she's asked for help. And we say, okay, we're going to hire an assistant, but really that's not what you're hiring. You don't actually know the full extent of what she's been doing. Uh, and in that case, being able to name what the job is really matters so much. Yeah. I think you nailed it. Yeah. And if there are, I know a lot of spouses like attend these webinars because mm -hmm. you are the business manager. Yeah. Um, you're the person running everything. Um, clarify your roles. It is going to do you well. A lot of times we hear people come and start using Gazelle, uh, sadly, when there's a health crisis. And uh, I was talking to somebody the other day and, you know, their business dropped by 60% when his wife got ill, she was literally the business manager and did everything. And over the course of a few years, his business just evaporated. Uh, he really needed that role filled. And, but he just kind of thought she was answering phones. No, she was doing everything behind the scenes. So yeah, name the role. And if you're in that role and it's not named, that's what I was talking about earlier, or George was talking about where if you're gonna hire an employee, even if it's an office staff, um, don't make their life uh, chaotic and miserable by asking them to do everything. You know, just say your job is to answer phones, return voicemail and return email. And at the end of the day, there should be no unanswered email. 
That's your job. Your job is to make sure that every week we have gone and called anybody in the area where we have holes in our schedule and tried to fill it. And you need to spend six hours a week making those phone calls. That's your job. Now, that's easy to do. But if you're not being that clear and, and you're in that role and you don't have that clarity, you need to ask for that clarity. And as a business owner, you need to give that employee that clarity. All right, thank you. Um, another question, should I build a service business or a rebuilding business? Uh, sorry, a service business and a rebuilding business or keep it simple and just focus on one or the other? I'm gonna let you answer that one, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Resident piano tech here. That's right. Um, I mean, obvious, uh, the, the obvious questions are, well, what do you want to do? You know, where's your wheelhouse? Where's your passion house? But let's uh, focus this question. There's a lot of ways I could go. Let's uh, focus it in on, from a simplicity standpoint. Uh, is it too complex? Let me rephrase the question. Is it too complex to try to run a rebuilding and service business is simplifying really just one or the other um, possibly in my experience if you are going to run a successful rebuilding business and a successful service business both business models are so radically different they require their own profit and loss to be run well. So from a business standpoint, you kind of have to internally treat them like two completely separate businesses. I imagine if somebody actually opened a retail storefront back when people did that, uh, and there was a piano service retail store, and somebody who wanted to do a piano rebuilding decided to open up right next door, and it was two different owners. Well, assuming they liked each other, there'd be the symbiotic relationship between the two of them because of the convenience factor. It's really convenient to send people from one or the other. Or imagine you opened a, a piano sales location next to the biggest music school in the area. There would probably be this symbiotic relationship. That, but they're two separate businesses. It's the same thing with rebuilding and service. And if you're the one running it, you kind of have to just keep in your head that, I am running a rebuilding business. I am also running a service business. And the two tangentially benefit each other, but they do, they're not interconnected. They're different things. All right, we have uh, one final question. Um, so it is, uh, this is back on pricing again. Um, when you were, we were talking about uh, uh, simplifying your your pricing, you said just uh, just accept all forms of payment. Um, this one says, I've never taken credit cards before. What options do I have for that? And does Gazelle handle any of that? Sadly, Gazelle does not handle that yet. <laughs> We're working on it. It's an often requested feature. And so uh, that's gonna be coming down in the future. But um, so right now you have a couple of options. It's actually a lot easier now than ever before. Um, it, George, help me if I miss any. The big ones are Square. Yeah. Almost every coffee house in America uses Square, except Starbucks, right? <laughs> they have their own thing, right? So there's Square. Um, QuickBooks has their own processing system. Um, there's, um, ah, there's a third one. Yep. Uh what, I'm, I'm totally blanking on it. It's, it's but not anyway, in my head either right now. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't matter who they are. They all operate the same way. PayPal, somebody to, mentioned Slack say, PayPal. PayPal's was Slack PayPal. They, oh my goodness, how do I forget PayPal? <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we go. Slack and PayPal. Clover. Uh, yep. I'm, I'm Clover. seeing some comments, Clover. Clover. Yeah, there's a lot of them, but they all operate the same way. So that's what's important. There's a fixed percent that you're gonna pay of the sale and usually they advertise 3% or 2.5% or 3.5%, whatever they advertise. It's not that rate. You need to understand that, okay? They are advertising the most common rate that you get charged. Every single card has its own rate. 
American Express is the highest fee. So a lot of times you see people charge like, well, we do everything but American Express. And uh, you can also look at like the uh, American Airlines rewards cards or the Dis. Anytime there's a rewards card, you are about to get charged through the nose. They can be up to 4.5% of the sale for the credit card processing. They're more expensive than American Express in some cases. So you have a scenario where in the fine print, when you read it, they advertise this one flat rate, but it's really not. But anyway, you can look at your sales as a general rule and say, okay, well, it looks like three and a half percent, 3.8 percent of my sale ends up going to credit card processing. Um, and so I'm seeing some people that Square charges the same for Amex. Do, uh, Brandon, do they also charge the same for rewards cards? Do you know that? Uh, and for qualified and non-qualified transactions, I think everything in Square is going to be a non-qualified unless you're using, anyway, uh, it, it's, it's, it's confusing as you can see. So the easiest thing to do is to just do a 5% increase across the board. Right, let me just make it easier for you. Do that across the board. Um, the ones that do volume, if you're doing more than, I don't know where the thresholds are, but it's something like $80,000 a year maybe in processing, it might be more effective to use QuickBooks or something else where uh, you're gonna pay a lower percent fee, but a flat monthly fee. Um, anyway, they're all there to get the money and it's going to cost you between 3% and 5%. There you go. Do a 5% increase across the board and start accepting all payment. Um, I can't, I'm not watching all the chat going yeah, on. Yeah, Brent, Brandon Robertson actually also mentioned, um, he said Square is, is very nice. I highly recommend avoiding your bank's merchant services. Yeah. I've had an awful experience trying to fill out PCI compliance questionnaire. Yes. Um, I had a similar experience with that as well when I was for another company I worked for. So yeah, some of these, these, these services like Square and PayPal make it very simple. Yeah. They We're simplified meeting. their service model and they made it easy to do business with them. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. There is a reason we said Square first. Yeah. Okay. Square was the first company that took all these principles that we're teaching you about your piano service business and applied it to credit card processing. 100%. They came out with a crazy idea that we're going to charge one flat rate for everything. Done. Now, there's enough fine print in there that you do need to look for the corners. But for the most part, I've heard people say, like, it's basically this one flat rate. But they also charged a higher percent on every transaction than everybody else. And so while everybody else was charging 1.8%, 2%, 2.1%, 2.2%, Square was charging three. So Square was making their money. But they simplified the model and now boom, everybody said it is worth 0.8% of revenue to have it be easier. Sold. And Square was the first company that, and now they're a big brand because they simplified for everybody. We actually did have a, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to add that anywhere that I have made it so that credit cards can be used, where I took cash only or check only, cash and check only, if I made credit card available, I have doubled and tripled my sales in every location that I've done it. Um, and so it, I definitely, so this is a place where making it simpler on your customer makes it easier to do business with you and people will spend more. And George, I mean, a lot of your past experience career-wise, those were retail locations mm -hmm. and selling products and things like that. Retail, so, leisure, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can tell you, it, just from a service standpoint with specifically piano service, I didn't double because I was accepting credit cards, but you know, there are thousands of dollars a year that I process purely because I, they can put it on a card, mm -hmm. right? Otherwise they would have said no. And so right. there are definitely times where I'm sitting there and I say, how do you want to handle this? And they're thinking about it and they're like, okay, well, it's, you know, $3,500 to take care of everything. And I say, yes. Their next question is usually, how long does it take? <laughs> These people will say, can I put it on a card? And they say, I say, yes. And they say, how long does it take? And I say, you know, two days or one day or whatever it is. And they say, do it. And they walk away. Right? So those things happen. And I can tell they would not have done that if I did not say, yes, it's easy. I take cards. Done. Uh, we did have one other question come in uh, while we were uh, talking about that. Um, this says, um, so this is to the idea of simplifying 
oversimplifying your services that you offer. Um, he said there are so many, um, uh, so many keys to a wonderful uh, moving or rebuilding or electric piano service business as well as acoustic maintenance. So there, there's a lot of pieces that go into it. Isn't it a waste to let clients go underserved in those areas? Isn't it egoist to, simply, to simplify only what's easy for us? So I think that's referring to only doing what you're, what you're, what you're best at, uh, your, your, your idea of, of removing things that you don't do well. Yes. Um, start there. Start in your wheelhouse. Okay, let's take um, – well-loved piano does a lot of things, but we don't do full rebuilding yet, right? And so I know that I want to do full rebuilding. And so um, between now – and the day that I do full rebuilding, I am simply partnering and knowing the people, you know, that I need to send it to. And there's certain rebuilding I know I'm never going to do, and I'm always going to send that to some other people. Uh, but I want to do rebuilding. And so between now and then, I'm not going to leave them in the dust and not serve them. I'm going to serve them through a recommendation to somebody who's going to do an awesome job. And if there ever comes a day where I want to open a rebuilding shop, I'm going to do it by making attainable goals and saying, okay, well now I'm going to start focusing on hammer replacement. Okay. So we're going to do, we're going to do a ton of hammer replacement. Now I'm going to do restringing. I'm going to do, I'm going to get set up for this. I'm going to pick it off just one thing at a time and I'm going to start building towards that. But it's the intentionality of saying, I'm not okay being the guy that says, sorry, I don't do that. And I'm going to walk away. I'm either going to have a professional in my back pocket who I can refer you to or I'm going to be actively working towards being that person that I'm not currently today. This applies to young technicians as well. If you're just getting started, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can't do. Well, instead of stressing about it and getting into hot water and you know, trying to overpromise, you know, just say, this is what I can do today. And then work towards it. If it's regulating, work towards regulating better work towards making it easier to play, work towards voicing and, and start offering those services. Um, so yeah, definitely not an excuse to just say, nah, not gonna touch it. Um, but on the other side of that, do you need to be the guy who's the jack of all trades? I don't wanna, you know, that's a disservice on the other side of the coin. So you need to figure out what your goal is and set a goal and work towards it. All right, well, that uh, was all the questions that we had. All right, well, hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for another Gazelle School of Business webinar. Uh, our next webinar is going to be on running a profitable piano service business. And you're gonna notice a theme between this webinar, the next one, and the next one, which is tripling your revenue. They all tie together, right? And so running a simpler service model makes it easier to run a profitable service business, makes it possible to triple your revenue. That's where we're going. Uh, so we'll look forward to joining you. November 7th is our next one. I hope everybody has a great evening.